I think we can start now and then as people join, they will catch up. So good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Christina Holliday, and I'm the Marketing and Business Development Manager for Hamdana Shamsi Lawyers and Legal Con Consultants. Today, uh, we will explain to you a little bit more about all the legalities and all the legal aspects, what you need to consider uh, when you want to do business in the UAE. And this will be presented by Hamdana Shamsi, founder and a senior partner himself. Uh, please also note that this is only for educational purposes and it will be recorded and may be shared later. Um, we will have a question and answer sessions towards the end of the webinar. So uh, any questions you may have, uh, please use the uh, webinar chat. And then once we finish with the webinar, we will be reading them out loud and um, answer all the questions you may have. So now I will hand over to Mr. Hamdan, um, who will start the webinar now. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Christina, and thanks uh, to everyone joining us. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we're going to go over the, today the le legal aspects to consider while doing business in UAE. Um, really focused on uh, people who manage businesses, who own businesses, who uh, entrepreneurs as well alike. Um, so th this topic really came about um, from the clients that we have who are entrepreneurs. Um, they really wanted a brief about what they should be thinking about, what they should be looking out for. Um, when starting their journey as entrepreneurs uh, in the UAE. Uh, and that really prompted us to, to make this presentation uh, after a few years uh, working alongside uh, entrepreneurs setting up companies and SMEs. So um, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> right, so a little bit about us, I won't take too long. So we're based uh, in the UAE. We've been set up since 2011. Um, our practice is mainly in the UAE courts uh, and in Dubai. Uh, we do practice in DIFC courts. So we have a DIFC team uh, who also uh, handle matters and practice in the ADGM courts or the ADGM jurisdiction. Um, we do, uh, apart from our litigation uh, services, we do provide legal advice and transactional services. So assist with um, acquisitions um, and advisory and restructuring. Uh, we mainly work with SMEs and businessmen. Uh, businessmen, again, who have a number of companies who um, you'll also find it important, obviously, to be in touch with the law or understand it. Um, right, what started all this? So the UAE. So the UAE government obviously is, is focused on entrepreneurship. Um, there are certain statements by the Minister of the Economy uh, that are very important and, and quite significant, actually. So um, the Minister of Economy wants the UAE to be the entrepreneurial nation by 2031. So years go by quickly. So, and so we're looking at in, in 10 years' time or less than 10 years, the UAE wants to be uh, heading the uh, the game in terms of uh, entrepreneurs and, and and really attracting them to the UAE. So that's a very important uh, thing there. Um, they're doing very well in that respect. Uh, you know, the UAE has been ranked uh, number one in the Global Entrepreneurship Index. Um, I would resonate with that. There's a, a lot of opportunities to incorporate, set up businesses in UAE. They've made it easier. The the Department of Economic Development, as an example, can set up a license within one day. You can set up a home or a business from home license as well very quickly. So it, it's pretty, you know, the, the, the UAE has, has certainly focused on it and, and steps have already been taken in all this. Uh, again, the Minister of Economy has stated that they want to be home to 10 unicorn startup companies by 2031. I don't think they're too far off. Um, whilst, uh, you know, I, I think we do, I mean, a lot of people have a way of, of, of defining a unicorn, however they want to define it, but I think we have few unicorns there. Uh, Failery, which is a website designed to provide news to uh, entrepreneurs, 
uh, found that there's three unicorns, but I think amongst that, that article might be a little bit um, uh, a little bit old. Uh, I mean, Kareem can be seen as a unicorn. Uh, Dubizel has been sold as well. We know very well uh, that that can be, you know, depending on how you see a unicorn, whether it's a billion dollars or millions of dollars. So there, there's a lot of, certainly there's a lot of companies setting up and a lot of success stories here. The the other side of the coin, of course, is the uh, the people that never uh, or, or uh, never made it. Let's say uh, entrepreneurs that did face problems, uh, that uh, companies that did have to close down. So these are the things that I think I want to focus on, um, ensuring that uh, those entrepreneurs that never made it uh, or are currently in their journey never face a legal issue that stops them from uh, from being successful. And, and right in, bang in the middle, I put their uh, article by Forbes, um, the 15 big legal mistakes made by startups. And what's funny is that, you know, it, it was difficult finding an article talking about uh, legal mistakes made by startups. Funny enough, you know, when you go and research about startups, about SMEs, about entrepreneurs, it's always those success stories. And, and and, you know, unfortunately, not a lot of people like to talk about, you know, uh, them not su succeeding, but it's important because we learn a lot of valuable information from it. So, so that's, I think, um, one of the things we want to help with um, and we want to help entrepreneurs in their journey, which also helps a lot of managers and a lot of owners of businesses as well. I think that it's all really uh, similar things uh, in terms of legal that you need to deal with. So without further ado, let's start um, and dive right into it. So there's five things I'm going to go through. The first is the structure that uh, you need to consider and how it affects uh, the company, the future. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the structure. We're going to talk about the legal documents that you might want to have in place uh, and be mindful of. Uh, then we'll move on to the key legal risks out there, uh, things to consider, risks to your businesses. Then we'll talk briefly about the last two sections, which are the legal remedies to consider and uh, dispute resolution. How do you resolve disputes? I think it's important to know amongst, you know, uh, other than the risks and the legal documents and all that, I think it's important to know what options do you have from the courts and what, what options do they provide you uh, if you're stuck or otherwise as, as an option, uh, as an alternative option to things. Right, so structure. Um, five things there as well. Uh, I love the number five. <laughs> so the, 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 the entity structure is one of the more important things to consider when setting up a company. Uh, even more so for uh, for people that uh, want to look at funding, raising capital, and all that. Um, so when we talk about entity structure, entity structure, there's two things. It's it's the place where you incorporate the company, and then there's the type of entity, so to say. So the place where you incorporate the entity is extremely important. As you know, the UAE has a lot of free zones, and then you have the uh, the corporate uh, regist registrars of companies in each emirate. So you have the DED, and then you have all the free zones as well. So there's a, a, a DED or uh, something like the DED in each emirate. And then you've got free zones as well in most emirates, actually, if, if not all in every single emirate, um, they would have a free zone. And there's multiple free zones as well. So choosing the right place to incorporate your entity or company is extremely important, depending on what business and what you foresee uh, that you'll be doing. The entity type is a type of entity, which are things like limited liability companies, sole proprietorships, limited by share companies. Uh, there's a lot of types of companies. Most people will opt for the LLC if they are an, an onshore LLC as well, if they are just having a certain number of shareholders, and they want to just simplify things, and things won't change a lot in terms of the capital and, share, and shareholders. And a lot of people opt for ADGM and DIFC 
if they have round of fundings and they want to go through that, uh, and, and that's the type of business they run. So, um, so entity structure is very important. So it, it's important to understand what entity structures are out there and to choose the right entity structure for uh, your business. Uh, second thing, which is related, of course, is the funders and the shareholder relationship. Uh, so you want to manage that. Um, I, I've seen a lot of cases where people down the line, you know, a year or even five years down the line, they uh, they seem to return and want to now manage the shareholder and funder relationship because they're all friends or they started off uh, on trust, on word of mouth and all that. And things get complicated and things change really. You know, so the funders today, based on the economic conditions, will have a certain expectation on another economic, you know, when things change in the economy, they might change, they might expect more or or uh, or want their money suddenly or want to want to exit before um, everyone else. You know, there's a lot of things that can change. So I think managing that relationship and putting things in writing is extremely important. And if you haven't done so already, I think it's a it's a good thing to prompt and to um, prod with your shareholders and funders. Um, uh, starting it now is better than starting it um, when it's too late. And we'll get to that later. Uh, so the third thing is the board of directors and management. Um, extremely important as well to, to structure that, to think about that. How much authority do you want to give the board, the management, sorry. Who do you want in your board of directors? I've seen a lot of successful companies um, owe their success to a certain extent to the board of directors that are there. Uh, they add value and you can extract a lot of value from the board of directors. Usually you want people who have experience, who understand things, who will, who will excel and push the business forward. Um, when it comes to management, of course, managing that relationship is as well important. It really depends where you are in the equation. If you're a, if you are a funder, if you're a shareholder, if you're a management, so some, some people can find themselves in different uh, places or they're everything. They're the management, they're the funders, they're the shareholders. So um, it really depends where you are in the equation. However, these things are really important things to consider. And I'll leave really uh, the questions and answers for any specific questions you want to ask. Uh, obtaining the necessary license to conduct the activity. Um, I think more so in the last four years, up to six years, I'd say, a lot of people have come up with new activities that were not in the list of activities with the company registrar, whether it's free zone or uh, onshore, the DEDs. Uh, so you, I, th I think it's important to, to push for the correct license and the, the correct license scope for your activity. I've seen examples where they've opted for a, li a certain license that roundabout fits what uh, what they're doing. And then later they were surprised that the government had changes and as part of their regulation, they thought that this license needs to be regulated somehow by another, um, another ministry. And suddenly they find themselves, this is a big business risk because in three years time, you don't want to suddenly be dealing with new regulation and new requirements to keep uh, the license or the activity that you are uh, conducting. So something to always think about, whether your license from the regulator matches or not, whether regulations might change as well. Even if you do have the license and there were not a lot of requirements, things can change. The regulators change, it's organic. The moment they, they find that they need to introduce new regulation or they need new supervision over a certain activity, they will do so. So keep your eyes open for that. Consider that as a risk um uh, that you need to consider for to your business the last is tax of course structure you know tax will depend on the structure that you have um again very important so keep an eye out for taxes uh how you structure your entity if you're dealing cross border as well that's extremely important to think about uh, how you can um reduce your taxes uh as much as possible legally of course Right, well, moving to the next. So I, I want to really invite you to, to start putting your, any questions you have um, in the chat, if you do have any questions. I know I'm going generally over the points just to bring up topics to the, for discussion, but do put any questions that you have in the Q&A. So legal documents must have. 
shareholder agreements, co-founder agreements, investor agreements, extremely important. As I mentioned a little bit, some people, you know, based on trust, based on relationship, they will continue a business, they'll continue a relationship without things that are written. Things get bigger, things get more complicated, and then um, they find themselves either in a dispute or or um, the the agreement needs to be put uh, right now in place. And um, it's always better done earlier than later. So I would I would say that and a lot of disputes happen as a result of that. So do put any agreements that you have with investors, with co-founders, with shareholders down, if you're not the same person, of course. So some people run, fund, and manage their own business, and some people don't. So it depends really, again, uh, how many hats you're wearing. So important things to consider, raising capital. So making sure you have the correct mechanisms for raising capital agreed already in place. If you do see that as a requirement, make sure that you have that in your memorandum of association or articles of association, or whichever free zone you have your company at. Management authority, important to agree upfront. Uh, put it down in paper, put it down in the articles again or the memorandum of association. Scope of company, uh, is very important. A scope of company meaning activity. I mean, in some certain circumstances, there could be different views about how the company should have developed or where it should go. And sometimes agreeing the scope for the company off the bat can help and just can can just align the shareholders and investors uh, to, to, to each other or to the management. So that's very important. I think it's good to clearly define what the company is going to do and uh, what perhaps it might not do. Um, again, clearly for the investors, clearly defining subscription and shares valuation mechanisms and all that. I think it's important to introduce that right off the, in the beginning as well, once you have investors. Um, there can be, and I, I think you should get advice in that respect. Um, there are mechanisms I've seen where where perhaps it, it, it was working for a, a time period. And then as the company got more uh, complicated and and no, investors and shareholders noticed other things around the company and the valuations and how things are done, they um, it, it, the, this sort of mechanism came in favor of some investors and not uh, in favor of others. So that's important as well to to really put something that will, will be long lasting as, as long as possible. Things do change. You know, companies are organic, investors are organic, people are organic. So, um, but as much as possible to get advice and put the best structure possible for that. Right. Uh, second is agreements with employees, interns, uh, consultants, suppliers, and clients. Those, I, I, I've all, you know, they are, they are different uh, agreements to one another, but I've clubbed them all together because there's certain terms that you know are important, and I just wanted to remind you of uh, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, making sure you know your secrets are safe and you can take action in case um, there is a breach of uh, of uh, any proprietary information or uh, or secrets of the business. Non-compete and non-solicitation, so it depends on who you're dealing with. For an employee, obviously, it could be non-compete, and certainly, obviously, non-solicitation applies as well. But certainly with con uh, consultants, with suppliers, with clients, you might want to seriously think about uh, adding a non-solicitation clause so that they don't take your employees, they don't uh, solicit uh, business of you if they are a supplier or consultant. So something to really think about, something to put in your contracts, um, the next is rights and obligations. It is, you know, as lawyers, yes, we can, of course, we, we're, we're supposed to understand your business, understand what you want from an agreement and put the rights and obligations there. But I think it's good to go over it before you just sign a contract, you know, just understand what am I getting into? What are my rights? What are my obligations towards the other side? And just have a quick 10, 15 minute uh, talk with your lawyer or or if you don't have a lawyer just you know review the contract and just make sure these are the right and correct rights and obligations that you can fulfill very important just to remind yourself and go through it sometimes i've, I've had examples of course of, of people um not going through it getting surprised later when you're 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 in court and it's already too late that you know that's something that i really didn't promise or 
or um, that I didn't want to fulfill, you know, or, or change or, or it was different than what you expected. So do look at it. It's important. Deliverables and payments like rights and obligations, make sure you have a look at them, make sure you can deliver uh, and make sure, or if you're on the other side, the payments are, are, are fair. Uh, last clause we need to really look at, and some people really um, go over, is jurisdiction and arbitration. Um, I've seen extremely funny situations where, you know, especially from a party that doesn't want to be uh, or makes it wants to make it difficult for people to sue them or get money from them, they would put an arbitration clause that is extremely uh, frustrating. Uh, you know, they could put an you know the parties could be in the UAE and they could put an arbitration clause somewhere really far away and an arbitration center that no one knows or not a lot of people know about to make it extremely difficult to sue them. And I've seen this being used. And they've done it before, and it's extremely important. And I've seen negotiations and discussions and contracts where uh, this discussion was was put to one side and seen as not important, when really it would be inconvenient uh, if they were to sign the contract. It would be extremely inconvenient to sue the other side. Make sure that access to justice is easy for you. You never know when a problem will happen and just make sure that jurisdiction and arbitration is, is convenient, uh, is the most fairest to you. And it's, it's a jurisdiction that you really believe in. If you believe in the UAE main courts, then, then do put that. If you believe in DIFC, ADGM or another jurisdiction, then really do, um, uh, do insist on it. Right, next is legal due diligence. The times that I've had cases come to me, extremely important cases, where parties did not have the documents or didn't know if this person represented the company or didn't even know who signed the contract are, are a lot. Um, and it's really, it wastes a lot of time in litigation. Time, I mean, not just for us as lawyers, but we, we feel some sympathy with the client because he suffers at the end. Uh, and it's it's definitely something that you can avoid and the, you can focus on. So getting the identity, authority, making sure the representation is correct of the company is extremely important. And I think people should focus on it. Um, legal due diligence is extremely important. Um, I've had situations where they've signed with a company and they find, found out that this company doesn't even exist. So... It's a, it, there's, there is a solution to it, but it's extremely time consuming, costs money, costs more money legally. Um, so do avoid it. It's an easy way to, it's an easy thing to avoid. When signing the contract, a lot of parties will be a lot more cooperative. I'm not saying they won't be cooperative later, but, but they'll be a lot more cooperative when signing the documents. And it is extremely important. It avoids as well fraud, it avoids, you know, anything. Uh, fishy, uh, getting into a deal that will burn you. So, so yeah, do do request documents, do get identification documents, in, in particular for companies as well. Do understand the companies you're dealing with and who represents them as well. Um, just a quick example, you know, I've, I've had time, you know, I've had cases where people have come, I've got, you know, I've said, you know, I want to sue this company and I've got contracts with them. And suddenly it appears that, that, that you know, that company doesn't even know who signed the contract and they never signed the contract and it was all fraud. So <laughs> that happens. So do make sure that you're aware of it, complete your legal due diligence. Um, regulatory laws, you need to know them. So you need to comply with them, of course, um, including data privacy, which was introduced in the UAE now. So if you do deal with um, a lot of client data, most people do anyways, you'll, you'll need to abide by the data privacy laws. Um, Depending on the activity as well, you'll have different regulations to comply with. Financial companies obviously goes without saying they go, uh, they're under the central bank or the DFSA if they're in the IFC. Um, website uh, terms and conditions, important. Uh, privacy policy and disclaimers. These are all important things I think you should add. And, and, and I don't think it costs much just to get you know advice on it, get it done, um, review it every now and again, but just, just put it in place. Just make sure you are complying with regulation 
uh, that's extremely important, including as well, you know, the tax regulations as well. I think that's as well part of the uh, scheme. Uh, so do comply with them as well. You know, all those, uh, I'm sure your accountants know about them. It's routine, but any mistake will cost a lot of money, costs a lot of time. So just, just check and make sure that your company is abiding by all that. Standard form non-disclosure agreements for your business plan and business secrets. Um, depends who you share your business plan and business secrets business secrets with. But I'm sure in an organization, you'll need to share it at one point with higher management, with a board of directors, maybe. So it's important to have non-disclosure agreement. You can even put non-solicitation and non-compete clauses, for that matter, in, um, in those uh, agreements. But, but you, know, you need to protect your company. You need to protect your company from disclosure. You need to protect your company from competitors if you're doing something different and there's a secret that you have that they don't, which is most likely the case. And that's probably why you've got a, an edge to your business. Right, next um, heading is the key legal risks to think about. Um, lack of KYC is extremely important. Know your client, not just from a banking sense, but but also just knowing your client is extremely important. Um, there are examples where uh, yeah, people have been stuck for three years because money was received and it was part of a money laundering scheme or the one of the shareholder, one of the suppliers or the shareholders as well in some instances uh, was involved in a case and it affected the business. So, so do know, not just know your client, no, really do know all the stakeholders that are you're dealing with in your business. Um, you, you know, you, you can know, and, uh, you can ask obviously, but certainly you, you can do your research about a person who is he? Uh, what's his background? Because, uh, you know, you, when you're managing your business, you want your total focus to be on the business. The last thing you need is someone distracting you. Uh, one of the shareholders is having a problem affecting the business, uh, dealing with a supplier or a client that is involved in something, and then you get roped into it. It really affects the business um, and really wastes time, valuable time that you can spend on developing the business. Uh, and fixing and putting out uh, fires. So certainly it is important. It doesn't take a long time to focus on these things. Accepting business money into personal bank account, that happens a lot. You'll be surprised. Maybe you know all of you will say, I didn't do it. But some people do do it, especially entrepreneurs who are, who are setting up and, and uh, it's growing organically or they have investors who are their friends. They will receive money into their personal bank account and then later, um, accounting wise, you know, some some amounts might not be declared or might be declared or not fully declared or how it's declared. So do make sure these all these things are ironed out. And if you haven't done it and you just started your journey as an entrepreneur, well, I would I would go back, iron all these things with the accountant and just get over it. So just uh, make sure it's all recorded. Make sure that when you do find out that there's there is there's something that you paid for. Uh, or didn't pay it for that uh, to iron that out and talk to the shareholders, get their approval, you move on with your business and, and to ensure nothing really haunts you later on. So that's important. So just, you know, you can get advice from a lawyer about, you know, things uh, most likely you'll need an accountant to iron those things out. So, so do finish them. Um, getting the wrong license activity or operating outside the license activity, of course, a very important point. Uh, if you get caught, by the authorities doing something that you shouldn't be doing or, or they think that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Um, it's a problem It's and, a, and it's a big speed bump. It will slow you down. Uh, so just, you know, it's important to, to look at that risk, ensure that the license is correct. In some instances, the, the regulations, as you know, as you know, for Bitcoin, for example, cryptocurrencies, the regulation was still some in some jurisdictions. The regulation was still not in place, and people were already trading in it. So knowing what's around the corner is important. Getting to know the people, the regulators, asking the people in the industry. It could be lawyers, accountants, advisors. They they would maybe have um, some information about where is the regulation heading. Regulation can change as well. So even if you are in a licensed activity, an activity that has been regulated for a while, regulation does change. Financial services changes all the time. Central bank issues new 
rules um, from time to time, quite often. So, so do check them, do make sure that you're aware of them and aware of anything that's changing. Not knowing, again, related to that, but not knowing the laws applicable to your business, regulatory law, tax law, again, very important. Um, you must know them. You need to ask about them. Um, big risk, you know, if you get caught not paying your taxes, there's huge fines in the UAE. Um, so do, it, it's better to avoid it, better to check, spend those, those the valuable time you have getting information about that and making sure that you're complying with those laws. Third party liability. Yes, if, even if you don't have a contract with someone, someone can sue you. So, um, or one of your clients can sue you if you do have or don't have a contract, depending on what business you're in. Some, some things are consumer items where you won't necessarily have a contract with them, a uh, written contract. Um, and some, uh, you'll have a written contract so you can put in all the clauses to protect you. So uh, again, very important. You need to be aware of the risk. You need to reduce it. You need to operationally as well ensure that it's reduced as much as possible. Um, it, it's a big topic of discussion. So uh, getting advice is important. Uh, uh, looking again into your model and your business model and your operations is good. It's good um, and it's healthy uh, to do that, to ensure that you, know, you don't get any... Uh, liability claim or liability claims. Uh, lack of agreements or badly drafted agreements with employees, suppliers, consultants, partners, investors. A lot of times uh, people come to me for litigation and um, and I tell them your, 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 the, the clause or the, the term that, that is in the contract is void. And they look at me, they look surprised, they're like, how is it void? How is it... And that's how it is. It's it's void. And, and and getting good legal advice about your contracts is extremely important. The worst thing you want is to have an agreement that's badly drafted, thinking that you're protected, and then finding out that you're not protected when you really need that protection. So do make sure you get good advice. Um, do use legal consultants that have experience on ground as well or if they don't have experience at least to, to to refer to the people with experience to ensure and cross check and ensure your agreements are uh, as they say are solid or uh, are not void or any terms of them are not void right the big hammer you know so the legal remedies to consider so so yeah so it, it, it really depends on the, you know everything depends on that big hammer if you do have the big hammer if you do have a strong legal case um, it will all depend on the agreement that you sign, circumstances, what you've done, your legal due diligence. All these things that we've discussed will ensure that you have a successful court case. And if you have a successful court case or you have a successful claim in hand, uh, it just gives you another option that you don't need to really settle for less. I've seen a lot of people settle for less, and, and, and I'll get into that just because they didn't have a good legal case. So that's unfortunate, you know, so let's get to it. So always, I'll, I'll start this section by saying preventative measures are always better than remedial measures. So if you have a good contract, if you do your legal due diligence, get all the documents, identification documents, making sure the company is, is correctly established, making sure the person representing the company is representing the company and has the authority to represent the company and avoiding these problems, it's always better than trying to fight it out in courts. So, so do your due diligence and get your contracts to be written correctly. Make sure you understand your contracts, understand what you are obligated to do, what are your rights, and if they match your expectation and focus on that. Um, so I would always say that legal requires decision-making. So correct decision-making first and then acting promptly. Act upon what you decide and what you determine with your legal counsel. I wouldn't wait so long. You know, A lot of people I've seen that have come to me have come with cases that are outside the time limit. So there's something called limitation, which prevents you from claiming a certain type of claim or um, amount from a person if, if, if the time passes over a certain number of years. So do act prom promptly on it. If you do have a settlement that you want to discuss, well, put a, put a target that, you know, I've got two months, three months, I'll try to settle. If I can't, 
I'll go legal. So determine, uh, decide what you're going to do and act promptly and act based on it. So I want to talk a little bit about the basic legal remedies, something important to know, um, uh, or uh, something important to know what the courts can can provide to you. So these are the basic legal remedies. There's specific legal remedies that are out there. This is not this list is not exhaustive. Obviously, the three is not everything the courts can can provide in terms of um, remedy. But these are the three main ones that you you, you need to know about. Um, so the first is the specific performance. What is specific performance? Specific performance is when you request the courts to obligate the other party, the counterparty, to do a certain thing. Um, it can range to, to a lot of things. So you can ask the courts uh, if you have an agreement or, or even in, in specific circumstances without agreement, you can request the courts to require someone to do a certain thing. So that's one of the remedies that you have there. Restitution or rescindment, uh, you can ask the courts to terminate the contract and take you back to the position you were before you signed the contract. Um, either that or compensation, we'll get to compensation now. But um, if you do ask for that, you know, uh, the, the courts will look to taking you to the position you were before signing the contract and performing the contract. Things like becoming a shareholder, for example, something where if you terminate that contract, and require the courts to take you back to the position and cancel, you know, that subscription or uh, you being a shareholder, then they'll take you back to, be, to not being a shareholder and require the other side to pay you your money back. So that's a, an easy example of, of restitution or rescinding. The third is compensation. So you can request compensation. That's most of the cases that are out there are compensation. Um, so if something is impossible, if you, if you can't go back to your position how you were before, then you just ask for compensation, or in any event, you can ask for compensation. Uh, compensation claims as well uh, include uh, the claims for any rights that you may have. So, so that those those are, are are within the compensation realm. So, just requiring the courts to um, to enforce and get money from the other side. That's that's what it's all about, um, uh, and that's what you're requiring from the courts, and that's what the courts will, uh, if you win the case, will assist you in doing. Right. Um, very important point, ensure that the, the remedies that you do do not disrupt your, disrupt your business or, or or land you in a better position than, or, or the best position that you can be. Um, very important. And we do this as a, as a law firm. You know, whenever we have a client that comes in, we do think about where he's going to be in three or five years uh, down the line. We ask sometimes the client and tell him in certain circumstances where it's applicable that, you know, is this where, is this, are you satisfied with where you're going to be in three years after the case, after we do the case? You know, and an example of not being a shareholder, we ask him, you know, are you happy not being a shareholder and just taking back your money? Is this the best thing for you in five years time? Because the last thing you want to do is, it, is think, oh, in hindsight, I shouldn't have done this or I should have. So um, this avoids as well emotional decisions and making sure that you decide your decision purely based on where you want to be and what are your objectives as a person or as a business, depend on, depending on your case. So that's something important. Where you see yourself in three, five years is a legal remedy you're, requ or you're, you're, you're requesting from the courts uh, going to help you in the next five years or 10 years maybe or not. So that's important. So what are the so these are the remedies. So this is what you can request from the courts uh, that they can give you to help you. What are the uh, resolution methods? So I'm gonna not gonna take too long on this, but you know there's there's mediation. So there are mediation centers that you can go to to try to settle things with people. Unfortunately, they cost money, so some people opt to go to, to going directly to litigation. But the mediation centers can be effective, can be helpful, um, depending on the relationship of the parties as well. Um, if they're able to mediate and depending on the experience of the mediators also mediators are very good in what they do of course and and can resolve disputes between people effectively um next is litigation so general litigation going to a courts um whether difc adgm or mainland courts of course each court manages itself differently so some courts have things like small claims tribunal to, to deal with smaller claims to make it cheaper or more accessible for for um, claimants 
So it really depends on the courts and, and it depends on the uh, jurisdiction as well that you choose. So um, if you have an agreement with someone and you, you, you specifically specified that all disputes will be referred to a certain court, then most likely you will need to go to those courts, to that court. If you um, don't have an agreement, then it depends on the jurisdiction laws as well. So, so it, it really depends on, on on the courts. Sorry, which courts you go to depends on the circumstances. So make sure you get good legal advice. You can lose a case just by not going to the correct courts, uh, which means losing a lot of time and money. Uh, arbitration. Uh, a lot of people. In the past 20 years, especially even more, uh, even before that, people started opting for arbitra arbitration. It's confidential. Um, arbitration centers are successful. They choose expert people in the field to determine cases. So some people do like arbitration. Some people try to avoid arbitration and, and feel the courts have enough expertise to help them. But arbitration is an exception to um, to the litigation in the courts, and it needs to be agreed in the contract. Or you can agree with your part with your counterparty that you want to go to arbitration, even after the contract is signed, so long as it's written, and you make an application to the to the the center. Um, so that's arbitration. I won't get too much into it, but it's an exception to the rule. And whenever you go into arbitration, you need to. Um, just make sure you get the good good legal advice about it. And finally, always consider the value of dispute and forcibility prior to launching a formal dispute. It's very important to know whether you will get your money before raising the case and spending the money. So sometimes doing your due diligence uh, before raising the case is important. Finding out the company is, is it working, is it not working, is it bankrupt or not? Uh, and if it is bankrupt, how many cents to the dollar? So some people do. You know, we've done this before. We've looked at bankruptcies, trying to find out how much cents to the dollar we're going to get, and then pursue the claim based on that. So it's it's like a feasibility whether um, it's worth it or not, uh, including the legal risk to it. So that brings us really to the end. Thank you very much. I, I am a little bit over the time, but um, I will stay a little bit longer for any questions and to ensure that we answer as many questions as possible. Thank you, so, Hamdan. We do have uh, quite a few questions. So uh, for those who have actually joined, uh, not in the beginning and, and didn't hear, please, could you write all your questions in the webinar chat? So we will read them out loud and Hamdan will answer um, one by one. Um, so I think we'll, we'll start with the first one, Hamdan. I think they're all quite good yeah. questions. So how effective are non-competes and non-solicitation with employees? What evidence do you need to present? How long is the process and how expensive can it be to get a resolution? I've been told that um, more uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Human Resource will only uphold terms in the official labor contract and not any terms agreed on separate employer-employee agreements. Okay, um, let, let's start with the, the first part of the question. So yeah. how effective are non-compete non solicitation Quite effective, actually. I mean, they if they're not void and you follow the rules, they will be effective. Um, you can prevent some, you can go to the Ministry of Human uh, MOHRE and stop someone working with some, someone else. Yes, sometimes people will work people, uh, unofficially, until you know the, the non-compete passes and all, and everything, but it's still a protection there. You know, a, a, a protection better than than nothing. Non-solicitations are effective. There's there's two types of non-solicitation. So there's non-solicitation of employees. So it's, if it's a supplier or a client working with you, you can prevent them from soliciting your employees. There's non-solicitation of clients as well. So if it's an employee or or it's a supplier, for example. They, you can put on them terms that they, they, they're not allowed to solicit clients. So um, the remedies here are, are, are two. There's specific performance there. So if an employee works with another company and he breaches his compete non-compete provision, you can require him to stop working for that company. And there's compensation. So compensation um, relate to both as a non-compete and non-solicitation. So you can claim compensation based on 
what is the compensation or the the um, uh, the the damages or losses incurred by the company? So the evidence that you need to submit. So we we do a lot of those cases, and um, a lot of it depends on the evidence. You're right. Um, so the question was, uh, what evidence do you need to present? So you need to present uh, evidence of of losses and what losses you incurred. Evidence of, of course, the clients going there or, or being solicited, uh, moving to the to the employee or whoever it is that that competed or solicited with you um, unlawfully. Um, that's first, and then the compensation. So so it is twofold. It's not easy. It is doable. We have done it, but it really depends on your industry and your clients. Really, I mean, how how do you deal with the clients? So it really depends on the industry. Some industries are easier than other because the ticket items are bigger, the clients are bigger, and some industries it's extremely difficult because the ticket items are smaller. You know, um, and 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 finding out every client that bought or whether they were solicited, solicited or not costs money. So. It really depends. The more, but but I must say that the more systems you have in your organizations that, that record data, the better it is. It will be for your case. So most of the clients with good systems are the are the better clients that su succeeded in those cases that keep records. Now, um, how long is the process, um, and how expensive can it be to get a resolution? So it is long; it can be up to two years but you will get your compensation if you can prove your case and you can enforce it. In some circumstances, like an employee who, I mean, if, if the employee is dealing with a big account and your industry is that way, it's structured that way, the employees deal with big money and he causes a big loss, then you know whether you can recover that from the employee or not, it really depends. You can, of course, always get insurance uh, and based on the case showing that he was a mistaken employee, the insurance company can pay. So uh, it's about structuring yourself to ensure that you cover that risk. Um, just remember as well, you can agree. Um, uh, you can agree um, uh, comp uh, agreed compensation in the contract. So you can uh, like a liquidated damage clause that that you know you agree with whoever it is that in the event he he competes, this is the amount payable unless proven otherwise. You know, so you can you can do these things that we can uh, we can draft as well for you or any legal consultant where you can draft uh, can help with. So the last point I've been told by the uh, the Ministry of uh, Human Resource and Amortization that they will only uphold terms in the official labor contract, not any terms agreed on separate employee uh, employer relationships. Um, I would you know my experience is different. So um, if something is written. And agree with the employee, and if there's a maybe what what perhaps they meant is you know if you sign a contract afterwards, it 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 um, it replaces the one previous. Maybe that's what they meant. But my experience is different. They will uphold contracts unless they're replaced by another contract, uh, specifically replaced. The other contract actually replaces the contract by law, or um, or it's you know it's void for any reason. Uh, so. By law, so uh, you can add your terms in the um, MOHRE contracts as well. So that, you know that's possible as well to avoid that issue. And I know they they have a system online, and, and we've had this from clients where they restrict what you can add, what you can't add. But if if you go to the legal department um, and insist, they they can add terms that you want to add in the MO. In the Ministry of Human Resources and Amortization contract. So if you if you feel that that's a risk, um, and it could be a risk, then then just add it in the contracts, and that will resolve that dispute. But if you can't add it in the contract, our experience is that unless replaced by a contract or stated otherwise, you can enforce it. Shall we move to the next question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So both disputes can Dubai DD can resolve and does DD has authority to give a judgment on dispute and when the only option is to go to Dubai court. So the economic department, Dubai economic department can resolve some disputes um, uh, or transactions, more transactional. So they, so the, the first thing they can do is they can um, stop a transfer of shares, you know, or if there's a dispute between shareholders in certain circumstances. 
Um, that's one way in which you know Dubai DD can help. Uh, does the DD have you know they, they, they don't give a judgment. So the question is, does the DD have authority to give a judgment on a dispute? They don't give judgments, but they they, they give decisions. You know, they're not a court, but they give decisions. Uh, for example, for consumer protection, um, the consumer protection section of the DD can give decisions, can make decisions, can can apply fines, can can do all that. So so it is decisions, and and there is a bit of teeth to it. There is a bit of um, action there. You know, they can do things that. That, that perhaps can resolve your dispute just by, by a complaint. So the, the third part of the question is, and when the only option is to go to Dubai courts, and, and when is it, I think what you mean is the only option uh, to go to Dubai courts. So when is it the only option to go to Dubai courts? I would see Dubai courts as a, as a, a venue where you can, uh, you have certain things you can claim from them and based on what you want to claim, you will go there. So if, if it is in your interest to claim you know, compensation, um, then go to Dubai courts, right? So it's a it's a organization that can assist you in in obviously resolving a dispute, but claiming a right of yours that you have out there. So I wouldn't put it always as a, as a last last option. I, I am a litigator, so I would say that. But um, but you know, it, it shouldn't always be the last option. I mean, you you consider your options. And if it makes sense to go to courts, then it makes sense to go to courts. And I know there's a big taboo maybe about going to courts uh, and avoiding courts, um, but sometimes it just makes sense to go to Dubai courts. So it shouldn't be the only and and uh, only option there when you've exhausted all the other options. So you should consider all options. If some options fall uh, or prioritize one after the other, then then that and Dubai courts fall at the end. Or the courts fall in the end, then 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 that that's a decision you make. So it really depends. But I, I wouldn't put it always the last resort or last option in things. Should we move? Okay, so the next one, um, I think it's a very obvious uh, answer to the question. So how SME can hire an expert to review legal documents, contracts, so that the entrepreneur do not get in weak contracts, giving unnecessary edge to the second party? Um, so, uh, I'm just thinking about what you meant maybe by the question. I mean, you can, uh, there, there's a lot, uh, law firms are available, so you can just approach them. Um, knock on the door really and just say I need legal assistance you can research about your lawyer find a lawyer that you think is, is most suitable or you can go on LinkedIn you can go on the websites you know just find a good lawyer word of mouth sometimes helps as well so um, so yeah you, you can find a lot of ways to hire uh, legal or experts to help you um, should we move to the next question? yeah um Okay, so um, adding a fixed footer in the emails mentioning that the recipient must consider all the information shared via emails to be confidential, does it hold in court? Uh, yes, it does hold. Yeah, if, if you send an email and it's intended only for the recipients of these emails and you request them to not divulge information or anything of that sort, it will hold. And if they do it and you can prove that they've done it, then you can you can sue them for it. So, so yeah, that's a quick. Uh, okay, so the next one: Are there any employee share option agreements unique to the UAE after certain years of service? So, uh, unique to the UAE, as in in the regulation, um, and mandatory. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I haven't I come across something mandatory there. Is it allowed? Yes, yes, it is. You know, it is allowed, uh, depending on the jurisdiction as well. Of course, uh, the way you structure it will depend on the, uh, the sorry the jurisdiction. So, in the mainland, um, there are uh, uh, so in the mainland you'll need to sign it to the shareholders because the shareholders own the rights to the shares, um, and it'll be a private agreement. You know, with 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 the shareholders. Uh, you could add it in the company memorandum association or articles of association. Um, it is allowed to raise capital in the mainland, but you'll have to do it through raising capital 
structure mechanism. And the DIFC ADGM is easier. Um, there are structures for uh, employee share options. So um, is there anything unique to the UAE? Not necessarily. I mean, so long as um, the agreement doesn't is not void, um, you can use it. Um, you can structure it how you like. You can, you can of course, ask for, for experts to help, lawyers to help, um, ask for examples or see examples. Um, so yeah, so you, is there anything unique? I wouldn't say so. We, we've dealt with a bit some share option agreements. We've drafted them. They are, they are similar, but there's nothing unique that stands out you know, across them with all the same terms. So I wouldn't say that, from my experience, there's not, nothing unique. Uh, I mean, they're unique in their own, own ways, but nothing um, unique to all of them. Uh, or, or a contract that, that that is all similar between all companies. There, there isn't, no. There are certain, online as well, you can go and, and find certain um, uh, agreements or drafts of share option agreements that you can find that is agreed or, or, or like a standard uh, form contracts, um, but nothing that unique to the UAE zone. Okay. From my experience. Um, how often do UAE federal courts consider varying the remedy of specific performance? Our understanding is that you are more likely to receive specific performance as a remedy from ADGM or DIFC, but less likely through UAE federal courts. Right. Uh, this might be a lawyer asking the question. Yes, that is also my experience. I have gotten judgments. So you ask your federal courts. I mean, I've gotten judgments from Dubai, Sharjah, Vajira, uh, Abu Dhabi. So really, most of the courts um, where specific performance, the, the courts ordered specific performance. So no, it is applicable, but yes, it is It is an easier option to claim for compensation. It really depends. Some people, some claimants are happy with just getting money and that resolves their their issues. Some claimants want certain things like shares, you know, they, they subscribe to shares, they weren't given shares and they're like, no, no, we want the shares. We don't want our money anymore, right? So, or we don't want compensation. So, um, in terms of a discussion or an answer, you know, the answer is the federal courts will give specific performance, especially if there's a security, for example, if a bank has a security that has uh, movables and movables and they want to enforce against their security, uh, that's specific performance. So that's, you know, um, especially if it's a movable, so requesting you know, a party or a, a party holding those movables to do a certain thing with the, the movables whether to sell it or to hand over or, or anything of that sort. Some, some transactions um, require specific performance as a remedy. So, um, so no, they, they do. Is it less likely than ADGM and DIFC? Maybe, but it, it depends on the claimants as well. You know, it depends on the mentality of the claimants and what they want out of it. So to a certain extent, yes, but, but I, I would still say that the federal courts do, do, offer, do orders specific performance but i've seen it you know and, and it works and the judges don't necessarily avoid it no they they, they do give specific performance if you, if you require it unless it's impossible to they give specific performance then of course it, it goes back to compensation all right i think okay. so we've got um maybe two more questions and then um if there is anything yeah. else then please um uh, email us and we can set up a meeting and advise you accordingly. So the next question would be, is there a legal protection for property buyers using cryptocurrency for their purchase of real estate in the UAE or elsewhere? All right. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the big question, cryptocurrencies, how the world has changed. So is there, is there any legal protection for property buyers using cryptocurrencies um, for their purchase? Um, I mean, the, the, for, let, let's start with the transaction itself. So that if you have a good transaction, everything's okay there. 
then then that's your legal protection and the fact is that you can go to courts and enforce your your uh, your rights now whether the tra the payment was done in cryptocurrencies and what when i think what i think you're putting your finger on is whether you paid in cryptocurrencies or, or any cryptocurrency let's say bitcoin you paid using bitcoin for a, for a property and the seller wants to say that he doesn't want to accept cryptocurrency well i think in the contract you need to specifically mention that um you're going to pay in cryptocurrencies because the currency generally in, in uh, depending on where the real estate is the, the agreement but uh, generally the agreement would be in a certain currency so if you're selling a house for you know, five million dirhams you'll, you'll, you'll put five million dirhams so it's ex the expectation is that the seller will receive five million dirhams in his bank account um the expectation is not that he's going to receive 100 bitcoins because it equals 5 million. So, so it, it's, I think if it's just done without any specific terms in respect of payment using cryptocurrencies, then most likely you'll find that the seller can object to receiving bitcoins and will, will say that, you know, you, you need to transfer me whatever the, 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 the value agreed as per the contract, which is UAE terms. And you know, I'll just tell you, this is my bank account, and please bring it or bring a manager's check for that matter. I don't think manager's check can work for Bitcoin. <laughs> That'd be difficult. So the usual transactions in UAE, we find that a lot of people do require a manager's check at transfer. So if you can do a Bitcoin manager's check, I don't know if they change their opinion, but generally it is a currency that, that, that was agreed in the contract. Um, so is there legal protection? Yes, if you agreed. So is there a legal protection for someone using cryptocurrencies? Yes, if a contract agreed that it's 100 Bitcoins that must be paid as a legal tender, uh, as, as the, the tender or the currency, then you can you can say that you've paid that by, by transferring the Bitcoins. And the evidence will really depend on, you know, whether you paid it or not, will depend on how to prove whether you've paid 100 Bitcoins to what wallet and everything so the agreement i would recommend that you that you, you put in wallet details you know of the of the seller so that to ensure that you lock them in that if if, if 100 bitcoins get credited to this wallet um and this is uh that's the payment done so that's what i would look out for but interesting question you know the things that are changing I, i've heard of certain developers um you know accepting cryptocurrencies um, I might be mistaken, but I, I heard about that. So, so elsewhere is I think very similar. Any other jurisdiction will will be similar to UAE, but I, it can be anywhere. There's there's a lot of countries around the world, a lot of jurisdictions. So you'll need to get independent legal advice for for other jurisdictions where outside the UAE. Christina, was there a last question or is that it? Yes, last question. Sorry, I accidentally <laughs> muted myself. <laughs> I was just saying, so the last question. So large companies have legal departments to safeguard companies' interests while reviewing contract and signing contract. Um, however, what can be a similar solution for SMEs? Are there legal firms to whom SME can outsource such requirements for each contract he or she signs? So we, we've had initiatives as a firm as well for SMEs. You're right. I mean, when you say SMEs, I, I think you mean small businesses more so than medium-sized businesses. Medium can, can probably afford lawyers for, for important contracts. Um, so, of course, the, there's there's a feasibility element into it. You know, if the contract is very small, that the risk is not so big anyways, then you, you'd, you'd think again about getting a lawyer to, to review it if it's, if it's extremely small. Um, so th there is a each person has an appetite for when he needs legal advice, but um, um, a solution for SMEs that we we've, we've provided is is obviously trying to um, to provide uh, standard forms or standard uh, agreements or standard advice as well to SMEs. Um, you know, uh, tailor making agreements as it starts getting expensive, but just giving giving them and telling them the risks. You know that the, this agreement is for this transaction, and 
understanding a little bit about the transaction and seeing whether it fits or not. So meetings help to reduce the cost, quick meetings, you know, half an hour, 15 minute meetings, where this is my situation and, and, and definitely homework helps. I mean, if the, if the entrepreneur gets all his documents or the small business gets all their documents, everything prepared and they go to the lawyer, they're like, this is my situation, what do I need? And, and whether I need it or not and what to do. So um, uh, our solution was to provide packages as well to SMEs. So we provided packages to, to, to help them, their businesses, some, something where they can, that, 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 you know, it doesn't hit a lot the bottom line. We try to do that. But I think SMEs, and unfortunately, I think SMEs disregard the importance of legal. Um, remember that, you know, an, an important contract, even if the lawyer charges quite a bit, could be the end of a business, right? So just because of that, you know, so um, because of a dispute, because of whatever it is, so it, it could be, or or at least a big, um a big hit to the business so i think it's extremely important the contract is big if it, there's big risks involved in the contract i think that the price should be paid and i think that you should put contracts in especially with your shareholders investors right off the bat even if it costs money you need to put it as part of your costings um so so that there are law firms providing similar solutions you know and 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 people can read up online, look at articles to learn more about the law. And I think as as small businesses, you know, they, they need to do everything uh, or more of everything. And they need to do their own research. They need to talk to legal advice when necessary. Um, they are sm a smaller business, so they need to uh, reduce costs as much as possible by by doing things themselves and, 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 and uh, taking effective legal advice, you know, using the lawyer exactly what you need, his high-level opinion, and then acting on it. Uh, thank you, Hamdan. I think this is the end of um, all the questions and our webinars. And uh, I think we really appreciate uh, your time uh, and, and then all the great answers. And please do get in touch with us if you uh, feel that, you know, you need legal advice um, on any any of your concerns um, regarding the business. I think um, the contact details are, are at the end of the, the slideshow. So you can call or you can email or visit our website as well. Uh, we would be very, very happy to answer uh, any of your questions you may have. Thank you so much, Hamdan, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Christina. Have a good day. Thanks.